Hello, everybody. Uh, it is so great to be back with the mixers. And I am so, so, so excited to have my friend and colleague, Derek Spiva Jr. here. Um, Derek is just an unbelievable composer and person. And um, I have been lucky enough to get to work with him a number of times. And as you heard from the opening clip, he is just I don't know. His compositions just really touch me in a way that that very little music does. I think it's amazing. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining us and spending your Wednesdays with us. Uh, my name is Ben Smolin. I'm the principal flutist of the Pacific Symphony, and um, I will be the host today. And um, just a quick few housekeeping things. If you have any questions for Derek during the hour, uh, we have a handy dandy Q&A button at the top that you can use to submit your questions. Um, you can also use the chat function if you'd like to submit a question or just have a comment about what's going on and uh, we will make sure to get to as many things as we can. Um, so just a little background on Derek, uh, his very uh, non-slouchy biography. Uh, Derek studied at UCLA and at Cal Arts uh, with compositional luminaries such as Ian Krauss, uh, Alex Shapiro, and Paul Chihara, who for Pacific Symphony subscribers is probably a familiar name. I know we've played a number of Paul Chahara's pieces. Um, 
He has been commissioned to write works for the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, the Berkeley Symphony, the Albany Symphony, Dayton Philharmonic, the LA Master Kraut, the list just goes on and on. Um, he also has had a composer residency with LA Chamber Orchestra, um, as well as being a mentor to young musicians with the Pacific Symphony Youth Ensembles and with the Salestina Society's uh, Sounds Promising program. In addition to all of that, he is the artistic director and correct me if I'm wrong, Derek, but I believe the founder also of the new music collective Bridge to Everywhere, um, yeah, yeah. which is yeah, this... a very cool ensemble. So Derek, hello, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. They... There's actually five founders for that 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 ensemble, but I, I'm definitely one of them. <laughs> well, yeah. it is very cool. And everyone should go check out Bridge to Everywhere. They do some amazing stuff. Um, so Derek, first of all, I would love to talk about the piece that we were listening to as the uh, as the mixer started. It's called American Mirror. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the piece? Yeah, so um, American Mirror, I wrote that piece um, I'd say 2016. So um, there was uh, quite a lot of stuff going on that year. <laughs> There's a lot. And um, I think what I was looking for uh, with that particular piece was I was just looking for a way to express without words, as music usually does, um, that uh, we're all in this together. I guess, quite simply. Uh, so that, that piece is really a reflection of the community that I live in, which is a community of many communities here in Los Angeles. Uh, people from all over the world live in this town. And um, I have friends and colleagues and uh, collaborators from, from all over the world here in Los Angeles that I uh, uh, you know, hang out with and learn from and perform with. And um, so when I speak my musical language, um, it, it always turns out to be a, a language comprised of many languages, which is actually what most languages are anyway. I mean, I, there's so many w words that uh, in, in English that come from French, but we don't even translate, we just say them and that's what it is, right? So. Um, so I feel like my musical language really just reflects the, the, um, you know, the diverse community that I grew up in. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting hearing you talk about that and having heard the whole piece. I mean, the, like I said, the first time I was introduced to your music was when Salestina performed, uh, the premiere of American Mirror. And one of the things that I was struck by was that it's this really natural sounding synthesis of so many sort of disparate musical styles and traditions and somehow you weave them together in this this way that just makes total sense um but it's also really interesting because you they each get their moment to sort of shine also um and so i'm curious like when you talk about drawing inspiration from a wide variety of different cultures like are can you talk about some of the specific ones that you have sort of been drawn to in particular yeah, so um, in well, well, so overall, overall, it's a, a lot of music from West Africa, specifically Ghana, specifically the Awe people of Ghana, um, and the Dagomba people of Ghana, um, which reside in two different areas of that particular country, one in the southwest and the other in the central north area. Um, I also um, uh, am a a student of Persian classical music. I, I love Persian classical music. Although Persian, the Persian classical, there's not much Persian classical specifically in American Mirror, but in one of the later pieces that uh, we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, also uh, Indian classical music. I'm a huge fan of um, Hindustani and Carnatic um, classical music uh, from, from India. Um, um, mostly, most of my training exists with uh, Tal, which is a lot of the rhythmic uh, stuff, for, uh, the, the rhythmic content from uh, from that particular style of music. Um, and then, of course, I, I love Eastern European music, uh, music of the Balkans. Um, I love the mixed meter. And then I'm just a huge fan of all music here in the U.S. I love jazz. I love gospel. I love folk music, uh, hip hop. I love making beats and putting beats with 
<laughs> classical instruments. Um, so um, I just love music. <laughs> and so, so those are the, those are the cultures that, that often make an appearance in my, my music is I, I like, I, um, because I've listened to these things and, and played these things and learned from my, these uh, amazing musicians uh, uh, from each of those fields. Um, I developed a, um, uh, a way to, to improvise in all of them, like cycling through them all uh, uh, with ornaments and stuff like that. So um, when I do those improvisations, specifically with American Mirror, um, a lot of that piece was, uh, uh, I have these instruments and stuff around my house that I use. And um, a lot of that was like, uh, especially with some of the middle sections was I just pressed record and then I did like improvisation for like five minutes. And then I took the different chunks of the improvisation and then put them together and then improvised on top of that improvised. So I love playing. I like to play, I like to play, uh, music. Um, so, um, yeah, just that's, that's, so those are the cultures that were represented um often in my music and specifically in american mirror it's uh west african um uh, some some north african stuff uh so eastern european um stuff and um and then of course you know appalachian appalachian folk music there's some gospel in there yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's really amazing it's on spotify if people want to go check it out uh, afterwards american mirror um and uh, uh, I also wanted to ask how you got a relationship with Salestina Society. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Salestina Society was founded by actually a former violinist in Pacific Symphony, Maya Jasper White, along with another violinist, Kevin Kumar. And um, it's a, an amazing chamber, chamber group in LA. So um, was American Mirror your first collaboration with Salestina? It was. Yeah, I met Maya because I, I uh, Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra had played the first piece in a, in a collection of uh, orchestral works um, called Prism Cycles Leaps, which has like some really wild rhythms <laughs> in there. And so um, Maya was like, oh, I need to meet this person. And so uh, so we, we hung out and talked and, um, you know, they had uh, played one of my harp trios i believe um early on and then after that it was you know i wrote this piece and um kind of as a gift actually to salestina i was went to a salestina concert and they're just attention to detail was just remarkable and they just seemed like the perfect fit to uh for me to uh to try this piece out on because it, it it's a different piece. I mean, when you look at the music, it's like, what in the world is going on with this? Because of the language, how it comes out in, in Western notation, um, it, it just, it looks kind of difficult. <laughs> yes, and but I definitely want to talk about that. Yeah, but it's not as bad as it looks. Like when you start playing, you're like, oh, okay, cool. So um. yeah, well, I think uh, I've got some examples to show everybody later of just what a Derek Spiva score looks like to the performers that we can parse out later. Um, but I think it's interesting also when you talk about how a lot of your process starts with improvisation and recording chunks and then sort of starting from that side of things, it makes sense then why the notation might be a little a little different looking um, yeah. Yeah. when you're sort of coming at it from that angle. Um, so, like I said, I got to know your music through American Mirror, and I was working on my own project and uh, commissioning new works for flute and piano. And I was like, I need to know this man. And um, so, our our relationship started basically when uh, we started talking about a new work for flute and piano. Um, we met at the Tender Greens restaurant, and um, I think that was something like 2018. Yeah, yeah. So and much, yeah. Um, and basically, we, we agreed that we would uh, it would be a, a you know fifteen to twenty minute work for flute and piano. Um, I know that you were uh, interested in having me play some alternative flutes, and we had a back and forth about that. So it has alto flute, regular flute, piccolo in it, which ended up being genius. Um, and premiered the piece in twenty nineteen. And you know, you mentioned as one of your influences gospel music, and I think that also has a an interesting tie in with 
with this piece, Grace Unbound. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what your inspiration was for for this piece? And yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so along with the the other um, cultural influences that I was talking about, as far as like Eastern European music and some Carnatic Hindustani music. Um, gospel music has always been a big part of my my upbringing, my background, and this particular piece uh, was was very inspired by um, by uh, Amazing Grace, sung by Aretha Franklin in 1972. Uh, and one of the things that um, mesmerizes me about that performance so much is the 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 um the openness of the time like of, of timing and rhythmic structure it's very open the way that this uh the way that her performance goes and i just love that about music when music can be so open and free like that and so there's a lot of that in this piece where um there's a lot of a lot of music that's that's derived from from improvisation and i mean for me, at least, uh, composition is nothing but improvisation, and, and sometimes it's documented, and then and the score comes out, right? But the the core of it is is this kind of improvisatory uh, approach to music making. Um, and then for me, what I what I what I was doing with your piece, uh, the 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 Grace Unbound, is really just you know, playing and then just letting the notes like sit, fall where they fell in the time and then just maneuvering all of the, the, uh, the uh, notation like around that. Uh, so it was a really, really fun process. Sometimes when I play, I cry because it just, it, you know, just a resonating, you know, it resonates. Uh, with me, at least. I hope it resonates with other people. <laughs> or else I, I mean, don't I have think... any work. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, particularly with this piece and, and you know, being part of the project, and um, I, I was just so blown away. It's really unlike any other piece for, certainly for flute, that I've ever come across and ever played. Um, we're going to take a listen to a portion of it. Uh, before we do that, I wanted to just show everybody just a little piece of the score to talk about what you mentioned in terms of sort of your style of notation. Um, so let me see if I can pull this up. Can you see that? <laughs> um, so I think I'm sharing the screen. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So for anybody who is familiar with music notation, uh, there are a lot of sort of less standard things on, on a page like this. And I think one of the most, um, interesting to me and probably one of the things that I imagine performers freak out about maybe the most is is the grace note notation. So you'll notice that between the larger notes there are lots of small notes sort of squeezed between lots of them. Um, can you talk about sort of how you develop that as a technique and, and sort of what you're going for when you write something like that? Yeah so I think this was pre uh, me figuring out a different um, symbol to put on top of the notes but essentially that grace note is like a, um, it's like a, a real flick of the finger. Like a, 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 now it has, now I've actually created an articulation that's called a blink where it's really, really fast and really, really light. And it's also, uh, you know, it's a half step above the note that uh, the, the, the main note, and it just happens like really, really fast. Um, and that particular style is actually used um, as like a secondary, uh, uh, like a secondary vibrato in certain ways, uh, um, mm. and uh, when playing, and so that's why we see that all over the place. It's uh, part of the ornamentation of of many different uh, approaches to, to music performance. So that's what that that's what all of the grace note stuff is. It's very very decorative and or ornament uh, ornamented uh, there. And then yeah, of course I the think piano part is like, there's a lot of free time <laughs> in that piano part there. Yeah, a lot of open space. And uh, if people take a look at the, what, the fourth system, there's there are these re repeating motifs and then you have the bar going across. So it's, it's very much, um, 
yeah, free and sort of up to the performer how that how that goes. And um, all stuff that I mean, definitely takes some getting used to, but I think the effect is just so cool and so unlike uh, unlike other music that I've come across. Um, and so why don't we take a listen to some of that and we can sort of hear what it sounds like in practice. So the video we have to share now is, um, oh, and we have Kateri who says, I wanna play this piece, definitely play this piece. It's so much fun. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna take a listen to uh, the first portion of the piece. This is from, this is a video from the world premiere of it. It took place in Pasadena in I think April of 2019. Um, which I can't believe is almost two years ago at this point. Um, and before we watch it, I want to also just whet everyone's appetite that uh, Derek and I and the pianist for this agent are going to be working on a really cool full produ production music video with you know dancing and drone footage. And so that uh, you should just look out for that maybe early May-ish. Uh, but for now, we have a very uh, much more standard concert performance. So here we go.
So Grace Unbound, um, super, super fun piece to play. I was so honored that you uh, were willing to write that and, and you know, allow me to premiere it and all of that. It was really wonderful and super excited to record it uh, in a different way in the next few months. And if anybody's curious, I believe that video, I believe that video is on YouTube if people want to see the rest of it. Um, it's, it's over a 20 minute piece. So <laughs> there's quite a bit to unpack there. Um, Anyway, really, really fun. Um, so I wanted to switch gears just a little bit and talk to you, Derek, because in addition to your prolific work as a composer, you're also a uh, really committed educator. Um, and I mentioned at the top two of the programs that you've worked with. Can you talk a little bit about the work you've done with the Pacific Symphony Youth Ensemble students? Yeah, uh, so with the uh, the, Pacific uh, Youth Ensemble students, uh, essentially it was um, uh, composition guidance. Uh, these are young people that are interested in, in composing, um, whether they're interested in composing for a career or just interested in the process of getting out artistic expression by writing music, um, not necessarily for, for, for a profession or not. Uh, they have the opportunity to uh, to work with me through the Pacific Youth Ensembles. And as part of that, I serve as like a guide, an instructor, a com composition teacher, whatever you wanna call it, um, to kind of help them figure out how to get their language out uh, in, in composition form. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a really wonderful thing because, you know, I always think about something that's, often said in my family where you know once you learn something and you've got something under your under your fingers under your belt if, if you're not passing it on to somebody else then like what are you doing here <laughs> you know? yeah well i'm curious like to me it's very daunting the idea of teaching something like composition i mean teaching flute for example it's like it's pretty straightforward there are right ways to do things and wrong ways to do things but composition seems much more open-ended it's very personal. Um, what is it like? What? How do you mentor somebody and encourage them to in developing their own musical voice? Um, I, I'm just curious what a composition lesson looks like and what guidance in that way looks like, so that you're sort of offering guidance but still allowing them to blossom in their own individual way. Yeah. So first, I'm just asking what they want. You know, like what do you what do you want out of this, or what do you what do you are you are you searching for something because if they're searching for something right off the bat then you know i can change the the methods that i use so like we can get to that thing like whatever that thing is but sometimes they're just like oh you know i'm not necessarily searching for something in particular i just want to i just want to write music you know i just want to be able to write music and um often the first hurdle to get over is how they want to write the music do they want to write it in a notation software program or do they want to just play it and record themselves playing it and then we figure out how to write it out later uh we kind of have to figure out like what way of composing music works best for them and resonates with them because sometimes students will sit down and they'll just start using a notation software but notation software uh specifically like um, uh, engraving software is usually met the, it was it was created to engrave something that's already been composed, not necessarily to compose inside of it. And so sometimes when students are trying to compose inside the engraving software, uh, the, the software will like kind of force them or guide them or kind of manipulate them into writing the simplest thing possible because the simpler you write, the easier it is to use the program. <laughs> And so, um, so sometimes that doesn't work for students and they don't realize that you don't need to like compose in the software. Um, so like, so then we find other ways of like using recording or, or using a digital audio workstation or whatever we can to find the most comfortable output for their creativity. And then, um, and then you know, moving forward on from that, if, if the end goal is to just have like a recording of something amazing that's, that's that mostly exists in technology than the pieces done after that. But if we're wanting to get something in front of people, in front of, you know, 
specific symphony members or or the students themselves to play then we've got to make sure that it's written out so that we can read it so either way that the music is created eventually we go to notation and and the students are able to kind of get it out so yeah i mean there's a really interesting point though what you talked about where you know the music notation software like finale or sibelius is obviously set up to be the simplest way to notate in styles that exist or the, the styles that it is supposed to be as streamlined as possible. So if you're writing something in a way that's new, it's probably going to you have to have some workarounds. Yeah, yeah. You uh, otherwise, you're going to get sort of bit. pigeonholed into it. So it's interesting, <laughs> like what you were talking about with creating a new, a new notation like the blink, which I'm very excited to see. Um, that, you know, if you weren't sort of set on doing that, it might that software might sort of guide you in a different direction to try to move away from something like that because it's not already in the system. So I don't know, I think that's really interesting. Um, and so what would you say to a student, like let's say a, you know, a performing student who plays an instrument and who you know, might be interested in composition but finds it very daunting. Like I, I'm sort of asking selfishly, I, I as a performer find the idea of putting down musical thoughts on paper and, and creating something out of nothing to be very intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm, I always encourage people to, 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 um, to play first, sometimes just closing your eyes and playing, even if an excerpt comes to mind, just, just to play. And, uh, uh, and I think that that, to me, that really takes the edge off. I think sometimes, I think there's just this, this is media per perpetuated image of like some composer playing piano with a, with the sheet there, you know, writing, but not everybody writes like that. Like there people write, people use uh, like an infinite amount of methods um, uh, to write music. And, um, and so, so there's no like wrong way to write. There's no right way to write. There's just what resonates with you and what's most comfortable for you. And I think that kind of remembering that right when you get started uh, really takes the edge off so, so that you don't, you know, you, you don't put a first note down or play that first note and then immediately start comparing yourself to some, you know, some composer from, from a long time ago who's got accolades galore, you know, uh, uh, because it's not about that. And, and the other thing is, is uh, we're all here and alive now and, and composition that's happening right now is meant to resonate with the people that are here in, in this day at this time. And so as much as we enjoy the classics and enjoy uh, some of the, the canon uh, from the past, um, I've I always encourage people to also, if you want to write something, write something now, um, because it's for us. It's for everybody here right now. So, Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And sort of on the other, on the sort of the back end of com composition, and I'm wondering this for yourself and then also how you teach this for students, I imagine that, for example, it must be very difficult to, you have to really think through when you're having your music performed by performers, especially for the first time, how to verbalize how you want something to sound, particularly if it's a new way of playing or a new type of sound. Um, how, how do you deal with that yourself? And is that something that you find that you have to have conversations with, with your composition students, like how to explain your music to a performer? Yeah, that's also a big part of it. And a lot of it comes from being able to play what you wrote, right? Like that's, that's, that's a huge part of it. So I actually, I have a bunch of flutes lying around the house. I'm not a flautist, but I do use them sometimes to uh, articulate the, the kind of ornamentation that I'm looking for, because not a lot of people have seen that blink and don't really know necessarily know what I'm talking about. Um, the other thing is, is I create mock-ups for people so that they can hear the pieces and, and uh, get a, a, a close idea of what's going on. Sometimes I have to, if I'm, write, if I'm writing something for the master chorale or any other choir, I'm, I'm singing my own parts so that I can say, this is kind of what I'm trying to go for. So I have to sing it and, and do the whole thing. So a lot of it is about, you know, being able to some certain extent, and people aren't looking for like a professional it's hard to be like a, a almost impossible to be a professional of every single instrument, right? So like you do the best you can, but you just make sure that you're able to articulate 
um, what you can about the style uh, by using examples, whether the examples that you give yourself or examples of other people that 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 uh, that have have done work in these other communities. In my, in my case, um, that people can really get uh, get a foothold on 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 what's going on. Oh, you're on mute, Ben. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm very technologically challenged. You know, something else you touched on a minute ago was the idea that contemporary music, music being written now, should in its best form resonate with people who live now because it's it's a product of the times. And um, that reminds me of another clip I want to show everyone. Um, and it's the the third part of your cycle prism cycles leaps that you wrote um this one for the la chamber orchestra um can you tell us a little bit about it there i mean the reason this resonated to me was you know we're in lockdown it's may things are you know seeming sort of bleak and then this just sort of explosion of joy uh from you and all the musicians there shows up on my screen and i was like it, it truly it struck a, a really um, powerful chord with me. So I'm just curious the sort of the history of it and how the pandemic ended up sort of changing your plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So To Be a Horizon was supposed to be premiered uh, last year in May, but, you know, a pandemic. So um, so uh, the, the, the piece, because I wasn't able to have it premiered, um, I still wanted to have, I still wanted to get it out to the public uh, in some way. Um, composition pieces that are written now are really important for the people here right now. Really, really important because, and there's 7 million people, or give or take uh, several million um, on this planet. Uh, and in and, and each billion, there's many people that resonate with different, different uh, uh, pieces of music, different, different art, different films, all of these things. And so, um, so it's really important that that uh, you know, when a new piece is created, uh, that it gets played and 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 many times, as many times as possible, because it's for everybody right now. Um, and and uh, so with this piece, I just didn't want to have it kind of just get canceled completely. So I worked with the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra to put together the last three minutes and thirty seconds of the piece uh, was like a kind of a good spot. Um, for 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 technologically and logistically for putting together the 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 previous minutes of the piece probably wouldn't be able to be done unless it was in person but the but the last three minutes and, and 30 uh, seconds uh, was was very accessible um, for for them to play and uh, the piece the piece is uh, just a, a, you know another one of my kind of approaches to to uh, uh, cross-cultural classical music. So it's got a lot of in influences from all of the cultures that I mentioned before. And um, I also have, you know, someday when the score comes out um, and the, 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 the piece is premiered, I, I want to put the score out. And I love to like do an ethnomusicological analyzation of my own work so that people understand like what's going on and like how it functions so that people can um, really get inspired to go and see some of the uh, some of the inspiration for my music um, in its traditional form, uh, which certainly does not need me uh, to be amazing. So um, I love to I, I, I love it when uh, you know one time I was working with the uh, the Santa Clarita Valley Youth Orchestra and we played a piece that was inspired by uh, Carnatic classical music. And someone came out afterwards and they said, well, you know what? I didn't know that I like Carnatic music, but I think I do because I heard you guys playing that piece. And then they went home and looked up a bunch of stuff and have been listening to it ever since. So those are the kind of moments that I like to uh, have happen uh, when people either hear, hear my music or encounter a performance that I'm involved in. Yeah, I mean, I think that should be the goal of all of us. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, why don't we take a listen to the piece? Um, can you tell us just a little bit about the other performers? Obviously, we have the members of the chamber orchestra, but then um, there are yeah. a couple other special guests. Yeah, so Siley Oak is there, and she's keeping tall with me sometimes. So you'll see see me counting uh, with my fingers. That's a specific uh, rhythmic cycle that the first 
minute and a half is so or so is set in, and that has something to do with um, uh, um, Hindustani classical music. Uh, there, you're going to also see Yeko Ladzepko Cole, who's a West African dance uh, dancer, who whom I study with. I've been studying with her family since 2003, um, and uh, so she she's doing some West African dance movement in there. Um, and then I got jealous when she sent me her tape. So then I did some of the dances with her. Um, this was all during the COVID thing. So you get to see all of the, you know, the, the Brady Bunch boxes that we're all tired of seeing now, but <laughs> it was cool at the time. So, uh, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a really good time. And uh, it's a very optimistic sounding work. <laughs> Great. Well, let's take a listen. Hey everybody, Derek Spiva Jr. here to present the world premiere excerpt of my new piece, To Be A Horizon. I'm surrounded by all these wonderful instruments because they all represent a culture that has had a major impact on my life and my music. You're going to see myself and Siley Oak counting tall from Indian classical music. You're going to see Yeko Ledzepko Cole doing some traditional Ghanaian dance. I'm probably going to jump in there with her. And then of course you're going to see the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra musicians who did recordings of all their parts and sent them all in so we could put them all together. And you're also going to hear some influences from Persian classical music. I hope you enjoy it. Look forward to talking to you more about the piece at the end. Enjoy.
Welcome back. I really hope you enjoyed. So anyway, <laughs> unreal. I wrote this in the chat, but I just I literally can't watch that and not have a huge smile on my face. Every bit of it. It's every element is so amazing. Um, so do you have any idea? I mean, I, probably not yet, but is there any any clue of when the whole piece might get to be performed and premiered? Well, um, actually, uh, well, for Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, I believe it's going to be uh, 21 22, somewhere in the 21 22 season. Um, and also, it's going to be performed by uh, Chicago Sinfonietta, and they want to put uh, some dancers with it. They want to kind of go all out. Uh, so <laughs> amazing. That's great. Yeah, we had um, May Ann Chen was my guest many moons ago on, on these mixers. Uh, that was, she was a delight to have here. Um, well, that's great. We should all take a Pacific Symphony field trip up and see the premiere. It'd be really fun. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so while we're on the subject of you and your relationship with LA Chamber Orchestra, can you just tell us a little bit about how that started in the first place? Yeah, so um, I was working with New Music USA. I, I su submitted a... Um... A proposal to New Music USA because they had a, a composer residency program and um, I ended up with a spot and the orchestra that I was paired with was the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra and so the relationship kind of began with that however the 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 kind of history of that is is um, ever since I was a student at UCLA which was way back in 2001 um, I was working as an usher, and so I was actually just helping people to their seats and scanning tickets for <laughs> for a very long time. And every time LA Chamber Orchestra was there, you know, while I was studying, you know, writing music uh, as a student, I would always just be back there, just waiting for my turn to get on that stage, you know, for having them play play some of my music on that stage. And so it was uh, 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 the perfect ending to that particular segment. Um, of my life uh, was to to really have the opportunity to um, uh, to, ha to have the opportunity to to work with Laco, and then kind of from there um, the relationship just kind of continued, and um, now I'm artistic advisor for Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, um, and which kind of uh, I get the opportunity uh, to um, to work with Alan Reed and Jaime Martin on uh, programming. And and kind of and which has been really exciting for me and um, I think the chamber orchestra is just doing a fantastic job uh, technologically um, and artistically uh, making it through these times and just really being innovative with uh, with their programming. So it, it's been fun. I I I, uh, I have to say they've let me do things that I'm not sure <laughs> another group would have let me do. With some of my music, so I'm just really happy that um, that I, I have the opportunity to to do it. So, it's it's been a real fun time. Yeah, I just think that it's so cool, and you know, I think taking risks like that obviously has amazing rewards. Like like even just a video like that, it's amazing. Um, we have a couple. Well, we have a lot of comments coming in about how much that clip in particular sort of meant to people and how much they enjoyed experiencing the music. Um, for example, Sue says, I will now need more Derek Spiva Jr. in my life. And I totally <laughs> agree. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we also have um, a friend of mine, Amira, who has a few comments and questions. So first of all, she said that she felt like the, the Brady Bunch boxes worked pretty well for the mix of styles in that piece. And it was, uh, Actually, actually sort of worked really well for that. And I agree. Um, and she also wanted to know um, about other cultural influences that you look to in other works and commented that she feels that that particular mashup of cultural styles really works well in our Southern California community in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's a, another string quintet, uh, well, a string quintet that I wrote um, that uh, really digs into um, a lot of blues like really, really heavy blues and uh, um, as well as some of the other cultures uh, that, I, that I work with. Um, and often, you know, often there's also um, Indonesian gamelan influence in my work. So that's, that's definitely an element that finds its way in there. Um, there's some, some South Korean 
uh, classical music uh, ornamentation and uh, styles that find its way into my work as well. Um, I just, I really love, I just really love how everybody approaches music making in a different way. It's just so beautiful. I, I think we all should really cherish that as a, as a, a, a community, as a global community, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I would also point out, as pr people probably noticed at the beginning of that last clip when you were introducing it, um, just the amazing collection of instruments that you have. I mean, I saw a sitar, tablas, uh, guitars, all sorts of things. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. How... Those are tempura. Yeah. The, there's so many. <laughs> there's a lot of instruments in my house. And then my wife has a lot of um, uh, uh, Vietnamese traditional instruments as well. So there's, yeah, my house is filled with with a lot of instruments from a lot of places. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so we've talked a bit about how the pandemic has sort of changed things, obviously with you know the premiere from last May having to be adjusted and moved. Um, I'm imagining like composition lessons and your work with students you know, for example, from the Salestina Sounds Promising program being all online. Um, how how else would you say that the pandemic has sort of impacted the way you work and the way that you deal with, you know, commissions and performances? Yeah, well, I think a, a lot of it has just become really very digital. And I think people kind of realized, at least in the classical community, how important the digital footprint is uh, for performance. And so with Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, um, I ended up doing this piece called Mother of Bravery, and Mother of Bravery ended up having, um, I actually had the opportunity to do one of the pieces that I've that I had always wanted to do that has a bunch of electronics with violin solo, as well as um, a piece that has text, and it's very like kind of theatrical slash uh, classical, um, which was a, a really exciting thing uh, for me uh, to work on with the chamber orchestra, and they did a phenomenal job. And I think the other thing that really struck me about uh, going through the pandemic is, is I think people also realize um, how much more open we need to be to different ideas um, and, and just different approaches, uh, not only in music making, but in, in the presentation of, uh, of a piece. Because the presenting of a piece, the performance of a piece is a composition unto itself. Uh, it can be a composition unto itself besides just the comp the composition of the music. Uh, and I think that that's, that right there is, uh, is uh, an element I, I, I hope that uh, cl classical music in particular continues uh, moving forward is, is really thinking about performance as a piece unto itself around the, 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 the piece, the, the piece of music that was written. Because it really has yeah, a profound I, impact. It becomes a real, it becomes an experience, period, rather than just a listening experience, but like a very wholesome, uh, you know, full body experience, I guess, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I think the more it's an experiential thing, like a cohesive, immersive experience, it's it, it just makes it all the more impactful and powerful. Um, and it's amazing, particularly, I mean, sort of a silver lining of this whole, pandemic where everything's been shifted to online and virtual is that there's actually a lot more you can do in terms of that and in, in terms of visual elements for for a particular piece and I want to tie that in with you mentioned um, some of the work like Mother of Bravery with Laco um, and I want to before before we leave I want to share um, a portion of your piece Mind the Rhythm can you sort of give us an intro for this and explain what we're going to see Oh, okay, yeah. So, mind the rhythm was a is a was a piece that was coupled with another piece called Mother of Bravery, which everybody should check out on Laco's channel when you get a chance. Um, but uh, mind the rhythm is for violin and electronics, and so I just really th there's a lot of pieces for acoustic instruments and electronics, but um, I the, what I really wanted to do was have violin electronics but with like beats in there because I love I love beats that's what I love to do and I really also love um I love polyrhythms and weird crazy things that happen with that I mean you know about all that Ben <laughs> but uh so so this is a piece for violin and electronics and dance and um I, and I really hope that these kinds of pieces 
are something that uh, that we can see more often as well because it really kind of uh, bridges a cultural divide uh, um, in here. So yeah. Totally, 100%. And this is something that I certainly, when I, I, I mean, I'm familiar with your music and I had some idea what to expect going into this piece, but it blew all my expectations out of the water and I'm very excited for everyone to get to see. So we're going to see the second movement of this, correct? Yeah. Of Mind yeah. the Rhythm? Yeah, yeah, we'll see the second one. Here we go. Okay, great. Thank you. 
And they were wow, there. unreal. It, it, I mean, I'm just speechless. It's so cool. Um, so it is obviously after six o'clock. Derek, I want to thank you so, so, so much for joining us. Um, and thank you to everybody who's come and spent this last hour with us. Um, if you'd like to check out more of Derek's music, you can check out his website. I'll put it in the chat. DerekSpivaJr.com, right? There you go. <laughs> or DerekSpiva.com, actually. Ah, okay. Um, so definitely you can check out his music there. Um, that whole performance, including the other movement of Mind the Rhythm is on YouTube and you can check it out there along with a lot of his other work on Spotify. Um, and like I said, keep an eye out for um, a, a collaboration that we're gonna be working on with Grace Unbound coming out in the next few months. Um, and yeah, thank you all for your comments that you're sending in, so much appreciated. Thank you, Derek, and we hope to see you soon. All right, sounds good. All right. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye.